Good afternoon, everybody. It looks like we are reaching critical mass for today's seminar, and we have a very special treat today. We're going to be hearing from Krista Oak and Cam Freshwater on ecosystem impacts of declining body size in Pacific salmon. So a little background for those that may be new to the seminar series. In October 2021, the PSC approved a series of virtual seminars on salient scientific topics to provide information about impacts of environmental change on management of Pacific salmon. And these sam seminars are or organized by a seminar committee that selects volunteer speakers and facilitates discussion. Attendance is limited by invitation only to provide an opportunity to respond to questions posed by the PSC family comprised of approximately 200 national delegates in the PSC process. Uh, these delegates include technical, policy, and industry experts and represent interests from the Yukon Territory, Southeast Alaska, British Columbia, and the US Pacific Northwest. So the Environmental Change Seminar Series Steering Committee has been producing a series of these seminars since January, 2022, to provide information on how environmental change is expected to affect Pacific salmon. So the seminar series involves two 20 minute talks on a specific topic followed by approximately 30 minutes of moderated Q and A. Uh, the two talks are complementary and their perspectives from both sides of the border, Canada and the US. Uh, and seminar materials are posted on the PSC website and recordings of each seminar are posted to the PSC's YouTube channel for later public access. Now today, um, we have uh, our two speakers. So first up will be Krista Oak, and the title of her talk will be Patterns and Consequences of Widespread Declines in Alaska Salmon Body Size. Now Krista is uh, currently an NRC Research Associate at the NOAA Alaska Fishery Science Center in Juneau, Alaska. She's working with Elizabeth Seiden and Kaylee Shotwell to develop a quantitative framework, framework for incorporating ecosystem information into the stock assessment process. So Krista received her honors degree from Memorial University of Newfoundland and PhD from McGill University in Montreal, where she worked with Andrew Hendry. Her dissertation focused on processes shaping patterns of parallel evolution or repeated evolution in stickleback and Alaska salmon. And then as a postdoc, Krista has completed projects studying declines in the body size of Alaska salmon uh, with University of California Santa Cruz advisor, Eric Polkafax and University of Alaska Fairbanks advisor, Peter Wesley. Um, she's also looked at impacts of warming on Eastern Bering Sea pollock. And this is with UAF advisors, Mike Glitzow, from Smuter and Peter Wesley. Um, as for Cam, so uh, Cam's talk today is going to be declines in Chinook salmon age at maturity and sockeye salmon size at age suggest multiple drivers of demographic change. So Kim or Cameron received his BSc in environmental biology from Queens University and PhD from the University of Victoria. So he joined Fisheries and Oceans Canada as a postdoctoral researcher in 2017 and is currently a research scientist at the Pacific Biological Station in Nanaimo, BC. He is the head of the Applied Salmon Ecology Program, which combines quantitative ecology and marine field programs to address specific management questions. Some of his current projects are focused on better understanding the availability of salmon prey to resident killer whales, developing robust spatiotemporal models of juvenile salmon marine distributions, and identifying coherent trends in sockeye salmon productivity along the continental shelf. And just a, a prelude, so in our next seminar is going to be July 26th. And we are going to be um, exploring large scale habitat pr protection. Yeah. And the presentations will come from Mara Zimmerman from the Coast Salmon Partnership and Roger Dama, who's working for the Mauchet Machalit First Nations. So with that, I will stop presenting and Krista, feel free to begin your presentation. All right, thanks for that introduction and thanks for the invitation.
uh, to talk with you today. Um, as we just heard, I'm currently a postdoc at uh, the NOAA Alaska Fishery Science Center here in Juneau, which is on Klingit Ani, specifically home to the Aquan. And I know I spend a lot of time thinking about groundfish these days, so I'm really excited to tell you today about some work that I did as a postdoc at University of Alaska Fairbanks um, and UC Santa Cruz, looking at uh, patterns of salmon body size. Oh. And I can, there we go. I say we because I'm the one here talking today, but I wanna take a moment to acknowledge that this project um, came out of a working group at NCs as part of their State of Alaska Salmon and People or SASAP initiative. And so the results I'm showing today um, came out of a lot of really hard work by a bunch of different people from a lot of different institutions. Um, I also want to take a moment to acknowledge all of the people and agencies that worked that made this work possible before I get started. So like I mentioned, our working group was part of the NC's SASAP initiative, which was funded by Nautilus Impact Investing and the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. And a lot of the data that I'm going to talk about today were collected by Alaska Department of Fish and Game. And without these really amazing long-term data sets that ADFG has been maintaining um, for a long time across the state, we really wouldn't have been able to ask the kinds of questions um, that we looked at in this project. So today we're talking about changes in the body size of salmon. And this has been a topic of concern for Alaskans, for fishermen and scientists in Alaska for some time in part because of the uh, influence of body size on the role that salmon play for Alaska's ecosystems and people. So in Alaska, salmon play really important roles. Um, for example, because they feed in the marine environment and then return to freshwater to spawn, they transport marine derived nutrients into terrestrial riparian and freshwater habitats. And so, for a given number of fish, the bigger each fish is, the more trans, the more nutrients each fish is going to transport into freshwater habitats. Similarly, um, from an ecosystem, but also population dynamics perspective, larger female salmon have more eggs, they have larger eggs and they tend to dig deeper, better protected reds. And so it's likely that larger females may have more offspring. From a commercial perspective, there's also a number of reasons why there's kind of a premium on larger fish. First of all, a larger fish just has more biomass, but it also has a higher recovery rate because there's more flesh relative to things like skin and viscera and bones. Larger fillets can be made into higher value products. They tend to fetch higher price per pound um, and they can be quicker to process. So it's likely that for the same number of fish, if each fish is bigger, um, commercial profits might be higher. And then from a subsistence standpoint, if you're catching a set number of fish, if each of those fish is bigger, that's gonna mean more meals that are going into your smokehouse or your freezer, which is gonna be really important, especially in areas of Alaska where salmon play these incredibly important roles for food security, well-being, and cultural connection and where other sources of protein might be unavailable or prohibitively expensive. And so this concern about declining salmon size is not a new one. Um, one of the earlier papers on this was by Ricker in 81, and he and others have proposed a number of different potential causes of these changes. So when we see changes in a harvested species, Often one of the first things we think about is size selective harvest or fisheries induced evolution. But we also know that as the climate is warming, there are reasons to suspect that body size might get smaller, either due to things like the temperature size rule and just the metabolic impact of temperature on growth rates and adult size, but also because temperature could have ecosystem level impacts that might affect things like prey availability, or prey quality. 
There have also been a number of papers recently pointing to rebounding predator populations um, and suggesting that this size selective predation from predators like killer whales and salmon sharks could be contributing to size declines. And then finally, um, we know that right now there's more salmon in the North Pacific than there has been kind of on record. And so we could be running into a situation where there are just so many salmon in the North Pacific that there isn't enough food to go around. And so we might be seeing um, reduced size due to competition from highly abundant salmon. And we got really interested in using the NC SASAP initiative as an opportunity to look at patterns of size change across the state of Alaska, across different species. One of the reasons we got interested in this question was a paper that came out in 2015 in PLOS One by Lewis et al. that compared patterns of size change in Chinook salmon across different populations in Alaska. And we saw some interesting differences, or they saw some interesting differences um, among populations. So some populations like the Nushigak, we see a fairly steady decline through time, whereas others like the Yukon, we see something different where size kind of stays the same and then has the dramatic decline towards the end of the time series. So we wanted to take this as an opportunity to kind of update um, and do a large scale synthesis of salmon size patterns across the state across different species to look at what might be driving those changes and also to try to ask what the consequences of those changes might be for Alaska's ecosystems and people. The way we did that was using data that was collected by ADF and G um, using age and length data. So the way ADF and G collects this is that in the field, biologists and technicians measure the length of fish and collect a scale sample, which is later read in the lab to determine age. And these long-term data sets have been compiled and curated at ADF and G offices across the state for a number of years. Um, and as part of the SASAP initiative, ADF and G shared measurements on over 14 million individual salmon with the data scientists at NCs. And I always like to take a second here to just think about the incredible amount of work that went into collecting these samples, um, sharing them, curating them, but also like thinking about that's 14 million times that someone put a fish on a measuring board or read a scale. And so I always like to take a minute here to kind of acknowledge the amount of work that went into these data sets and say how thankful we feel to be able to work with um, these really impressive long-term data sets. So the data scientists at NCs um, synthesized these um, different data sets and created data products that we then analyzed. And we can get an idea of the scale of some of these data sets um, here by looking at just escapement records. And most of our data came from either escapement projects or commercial projects. But we can see we have projects kind of all across the state this is a heat map. So those areas with warmer colors mean that there's higher sample sizes in that area. And some of these projects, we have data going back almost 60 years. And we had pretty good sample sizes to look at this question for Chinook, Coho, Chum, and Sockeye. Unfortunately, we would have loved to look at pink salmon, but we didn't have enough size data to look at pink salmon. So we're just looking at patterns of those other four species uh, across the state. We can start to ask this question of has length changed through time by comparing a baseline window before 1990 to a more recent window after 2010. And 1990 was a bit of an arbitrary window, but we see a lot of these um, locations, the data kind of comes available in the 80s. And so 1990 was kind of the earliest window that we had enough data to look across a large number of populations. Um, and to provide this baseline period. So on this plot, um, we're looking at the change um, comparing after 1990 to pre, or after 2010 to pre-1990 for the four species. And we can see a few things here. 
First, I've got that zero line highlighted in red, and we see that most of those populations, which are those little gray points, and most of those box plots are falling below the zero line. So size for most of these species is smaller um, after 2010 than it was uh, before 1990. But we do see some variation um, across species in how these patterns look. So in particular, the magnitude of change is generally greater for Chinook than it was for the other three species. But even within species, we see differences, first of all, among regions. So for Chinook from the AYK region, we see greater magnitude of change compared to Chinook from Southeast. And even within each of those regions, we see differences among populations. So even within AYK, we see some populations that have undergone re these really large magnitude declines in size and other populations where we've actually seen not much change or even a little bit of increase in size. So differences among populations, among regions and among species, but overall across these four species, we're seeing smaller average, average sizes after 2010 than we did before 1990. Another way we can look at this question of has size changed through time is to kind of take more of a complete time series and do generalized additive models or GAMs that include nonlinear smoothers for year terms and ask if there's been a significant um, change in size over this period. And we see for each of these um, four species that yes, we have significant nonlinear year smoothers. And when we look at the shape of those smoothers, we see that generally there's been um, a pattern towards smaller size. Again, we see differences among species. So here, the y-axis is going to vary among species so that we can kind of zoom in and look at what's going on in each species. But you might notice that the magnitude of change is, again, greatest for Chinook. We also see that um, for the most part, uh, this change in size hasn't been like constant through time. And instead for most species, except Chinook, we see these patterns or periods where size is declining and then periods of recovery. But what's really interesting is that in all four species, after about the year 2000, we see kind of an acceleration um, towards smaller size um, and fewer kind of periods of recovery. So again, takeaway here, across four species, we're seeing generally smaller sizes, not consistently through time, but we're seeing this interesting kind of pickup in the rate of change after 2000. And I mentioned these earlier, but we wanted to look at some of the potential causes that could be driving these changes. Um, and we're focusing on competition, climate, harvest, and predators. And right off the bat, we started looking for data on predators. We had a lot of trouble finding data sets that would really let us kind of look across the state, these four different species at that scale that we're interested in doing. When we did find these time series for species like killer whales, they tended to be, you know, model derived. They were often pretty monotonic, um, straight increases, and that caused a lot of statistical problems with, for example, collinearity. So, off the bat, we weren't able to address this question of predator um, predators contributing. We were able to look at the other three harvest rates. Again, we had some trouble finding data, so we looked at that separately. So first, let's just look at the analysis that we did to look at climate and competition. So here, what we did was a Bayesian hierarchical model that accounted for kind of absolute mean differences in size among populations, and then looked for um, associations between body size and uh, these climate or competition covariates separately for each species. This is a bit of a complicated figure, so I'm gonna to try to build it a little here, but what you're gonna see are mean covariate effects across stocks for each of these different covariates that we looked at. Um, North Pacific wide climate covariates are going to show up in that kind of orangey pink color. And this is things like NPDO or PDO and NPGO. 
Alaska specific climate covariates are going to show up in blue. So that's things like summer air temperature and near shore sea surface temperature. North Pacific wide competition will show up in green. And then in purple, Alaska specific competition. So for example, the abundance of pink salmon returning to Alaska. Adding some data on here, um, here those white points are the mean uh, covariate effects across stocks with um, credible intervals around them. And then the colors are the distributions of covariate effects for specific stocks. So the wider that area of color is, the more kind of variation there was in the response among stocks to these covariates. And the farther each of those points falls away from that red zero line, the stronger the association between body size and a covariate for that species. We can see a number of things here. First of all, we don't see any single covariate that's consistently um, strongly associated with uh, body size for each species. And so it seems that there's no one kind of single smoking gun that can explain um, these changes across species. And instead, it kind of depends on which species you're looking at and to a lesser extent, which stock you're looking at. Uh, Alaska abundance of pink salmon was the only covariate that we saw being consistently negative across all species, but that effect was pretty weak for all species except sockeye where um, Alaska pink salmon abundance had a stronger impact. We also saw certain covariates having strong, so strong negative associations for certain species. So as an example for sockeye, we saw a strong negative association with the North Pacific abundance of pink salmon. For chum, we saw a strong negative association with NPGO, although we also saw a strong positive association between NPGO and coho size. And so this just kind of highlights how it seems like the different species are responding to these different climate and competition covariates differently. But it's important to notice here that for each species, there's at least one climate covariate and at least one competition covariate that's coming out as important. And so it seems likely that both climate and competition are contributing to these patterns of salmon size across species. Um, and then it's also important to note here that we did also include these um, residual shared trends through time that weren't explained um, by any of the covariates that were in our model. So it does seem that there are patterns of size change that aren't explained by any of these covariates that we included. So next, we wanted to look at harvest. And here is where we had trouble reliably calculating harvest rate for a lot of different populations. We could really only do it um, either for populations where we could find published harvest rates or where we had brood tables. And so that was uh, 25 sockeye populations, and a lot of them were from, from Bristol Bay, and eight Chinook populations. And here, um, when these points appear, we'll have black uh, points so showing Chinook populations and green points showing coho populations. And what we would expect to see if size selective harvest is resulting in smaller size, either due to size truncation or um, evolutionary impacts of size selective harvest, we would expect to see um, greater negative change being correlated with higher harvest rates. So we would expect to see a negative relationship here. And if I add the data on, that's not what we saw. This looks like a positive association, but it was actually not significant. And so we're not seeing much association between har harvest rate and change in size. And so overall, at least for the period that we're looking at, it doesn't seem that harvest rate is this widespread, or harvest is this widespread driver of salmon size change. Now, I mentioned we couldn't look at this for a lot of um, populations. And this is not to say that there aren't populations where harvest might have a really important role um, or that you know, it could have happened some period before 
uh, the data that we have here. And there's reasons to suspect that, you know, especially those Bristol Bay sockeye populations might not be that representative. We didn't see as great magnitude size changes for Bristol Bay sockeye. Um, and we know that through the period we're looking at, um, gear type and gear size has stayed pretty consistent in Bristol Bay. So there could be other populations where harvest is playing a bigger role, but overall, the period we're looking at, it doesn't seem like it's this widespread driver. And so I started out talking about these really important um, ecosystem services that salmon provide in Alaska. And so we wanted to look at how the changes that we've seen in body size might impact those ecosystem services. And we can start by looking at, for example, um, the number of eggs produced per female. And here we again are comparing that pre-1990 window to the post-2010 window and using uh, fecundity length relationships to ask how many uh, eggs we would expect the average fish after 2010 to have compared to the average fish pre-1990. And what we see is that indeed, for the most part, we see reductions in the number of eggs we would expect um, for the average fish after 2010 compared to pre-1990. And of course, you know, we're talking about fecundity here. So there's potential for this to have important um, population dynamics implications for the same number of salmon. If on average they're smaller, we could see fewer eggs produced and potentially fewer offspring. We saw something similar when we looked at the other ecosystem services. So we tended to see fewer um, marine derived nutrients transported per fish, fewer meals provided for subsistence users, and uh, lower prices per fish. And here it's important to mention that here we're looking at per fish values. And so for certain species and certain ecosystem services, this could really trade off with abundance. So if we think about um, a species that's really been abundant in recent years, like Bristol Bay sockeye, maybe it doesn't matter if the price per fish is a little bit lower than it used to be if you're now catching way more fish. But where these uh, impacts are gonna be most dramatically felt are where we had declining size and declining abundance happening at the same time. And examples that come to mind right away would be populations of Chinook salmon on the Yukon and Kuskokwim, where we know abundance has been really low and it has been limiting um, subsistence opportunities. And we've kind of got this double whammy where when you are able to go out and harvest fish, you're not only getting fewer or being allowed to take fewer than you used to, but each of those fish also is likely to be smaller. And so that really could compound the impacts of these um, changing size if we've also got lower abundances. And so kind of wrapping up here, um, some take home messages um, that I hope you'll talk, take away from the presentation today. First, we saw that Alaska salmon are getting smaller across the four species that we looked at. And there are differences among populations, regions, and species in the magnitude of change. But overall, all four species that we looked at were seeing this decline in size. We saw that there does appear to be important contributions of climate and competition, but that there wasn't any single driver that was kind of acting like a smoking gun that explained these changes across species. And instead, it seems like it really depends on which species you're looking at, how it's going to respond to each of these individual climate and competition drivers. And we didn't see evidence for widespread impact of harvest on body size. And then finally, you know, most of these um, analyses we're looking at comparing post 2010 to pre 1990. That's a pretty short window when we think about kind of the period um, that Alaska salmon have been harvested. And we know that size change has been happening um, for a long time and much earlier than the 80s and the 90s. And so it's likely that if we were able to look at this scale across longer time series that we might have seen even greater size changes 
But even just looking at that pre-1990 to post-2010 period, we're likely seeing some real-world consequences um, of these changes. Um, just looking at the change in size that we've seen during that period, it appears that this could have some real impacts on the ecosystem services um, that salmon are providing for Alaskan ecosystems and people. Um, with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention today, for the invite. And this paper came out in 2020, so I'm hoping if you use your phone's camera to scan that QR code, it should bring you to a website to download the paper. But if not, feel free to send me an email. And yeah, thanks very much. Thank you, Krista, for, for a wonderful talk. And I encourage the audience to hold off on their questions, um, but to enter them down below in Zoom using the Q&A function. And after Cam uh, speaks, we'll have an opportunity to do a facilitated uh, extended Q&A session. So uh, hopefully you're thinking a lot about uh, the information that Krista presented. And um, next up, we have Cam Freshwater. All right. Um, well, thanks so much for attending, everyone. As Marisa mentioned, my name is Cam Freshwater. I'm a research scientist on Vancouver Island working with uh, Fisheries and Oceans Canada. And I spend a lot of my time uh, pretty dialed into the marine ecology of Pacific salmon. Um, but over the past couple of years, I've had the opportunity to work on some longer, more assessment oriented time series, uh, which are really going to make up the bulk of this presentation today. Uh, and it's been a fantastic opportunity to sort of uh, take a longer term, broader perspective on uh, Pacific salmon dynamics. So Krista already did a great job introducing uh, the general outlines of this topic, um, but I wasn't sure exactly what she'd talk about. So I'm going to cover a lot of the same ground and hopefully a slightly different complementary way. Um, but basically, I wanted to begin by talking about why body size is so important from a fisheries perspective. And basically, this is because it is directly related to reproductive output, um, and therefore, uh, from a stock assessment perspective, productivity. Furthermore, it doesn't usually scale linearly, at least with marine fishes, um, including some Chinook salmon stocks. And basically, what hyperallometric scaling uh, refers to, which is represented in that figure on the left by the red line, is that a fish that is twice as big has more than twice the reproductive output. From a more practical perspective, what this means is that uh, if you have one large 30 kilogram female cod, uh, you're going to have on average the same reproductive output as something like 37 smaller, younger uh, female cod, resulting in more biomass, uh, but the same number of eggs and offspring produced. So while the details of this relationship differ among species, the general mechanics are remarkably consistent and basically lead to fisheries managers viewing declines in size with very real concern. Another sort of general component that I wanted to highlight is the fact that in terms of mean size, there's a couple different ways that you can shrink a fish or at least shrink an observed population. Uh, one of these mechanisms is through changes in age structure. So most of the fish we exploit mature or recruit at different ages. And since older fish tend to be uh, larger than younger fish, if you remove those older age classes, then you'll see decline in mean size independent of any difference in size at age. That being said, you can also uh, see declines in the average size of the population through shifts in size at age, which basically means that independently of age composition, you see a, a reduction or in some cases an increase in size because individual age classes uh, are becoming larger or smaller. Um, and of course, neither of these processes are completely uh, operating in isolation. It's entirely possible for both to be taking place at once, uh, but it's important to keep them as distinct as we can because of the ecological and evolutionary processes that act on age composition versus size of age can be fundamentally different. Chris already did a great job uh, introducing some of the, the recent work that's been focused on some of these trends, uh, but I just really wanted to quickly highlight both a recent uh, paper by Jan Olberger and colleagues highlighting uh, declines in size and age of sockeye salmon in Bristol Bay, and also reference that 1981 Ricker paper uh, that Krista mentioned, which sort of set the stage for uh, growing concerns about these patterns. 
Um, again, like Krista highlighted, there's a wide range of different hypotheses that have received uh, varying degrees of support depending on which stock, which time period, uh, and which species you're considering. Uh, and she did a better job than I could in introducing these in detail, but I thought I'd quickly step through them. Um, selective harvest, she already mentioned, naturally mortality rates. Both of these and harvest are likely to operate in the same ways and, or in similar ways. And the basic premise is that you have higher mortality on larger or older age classes, which ultimately results in a selective pressure towards younger, uh, smaller fish, which shows up as a reduction in mean size. Chris also highlighted the, the growing evidence for density dependent effects during marine residence. Um, and that there's a wide range of different environmental conditions related to both physiologically, ph physiological uh, tolerances directly, as well as broad ecosystem impacts on prey quality or quantity. The final component that I wanted to raise that wasn't really relevant to Krista's talk because so few populations in her part of the world are hatchery origin uh, is the potential impact of management practices. Uh, so this can manifest itself a number of different ways, but perhaps the best studied uh, component is uh, directly related to hatchery rearing practices, and specifically the tendency for our desire to release larger smolts, which often have improved survival, uh, in some ways backfiring and re uh, resulting in a reduction in mean age as you get higher rates of jacks and, and H2s. And as Krista emphasized, Again, none of these processes necessarily have to occur in isolation, and there's likely evidence of uh, complex interactions between each of these components. So with the stage set for the rest of my time slot, I wanted to introduce two recent publications I've been a part of. Um, to start with, I wanted to, to really emphasize that they both differ from Krista's work in that we didn't quantify the effect of various drivers explicitly, like her, we ran into pretty severe problems running down a comprehensive suite of covariate time series uh, for, for reasons that will become clear later on. And so the approach that we took is to sort of um, examine the trends accounting for variation in sampling techniques as much as possible, and then qualitatively evaluate the support for some of those hypotheses that I just introduced. So to begin, uh, I'll just quickly introduce the first paper. Uh, which broadly explored patterns in Chinook salmon de demographics using a network of indicator stocks um, that are evaluated by the Chinook Technical Committee. So this paper actually focused on two different demographic traits, juvenile survival, as well as age of maturity. Um, I'm going to set the juvenile survival stuff aside for today since it's less relevant directly to body size, um, but I encourage you to, to dig into the paper and send me any questions you might have on that portion. So the, the broad um, strategy that we took with this paper was to, to ask the question, with this vast network of populations, can we determine ecological characteristics that consistently co-vary with Chinook salmon age of maturity? Um, to do this, we, uh, we leveraged the 50-odd uh, populations that I mentioned before. Um, you can see here their approximate uh, hatchery locations. So we have good uh, coverage from Southeast Alaska down to the Oregon coast with a lot of populations throughout both the Salish Sea and the Columbia River. Uh, our time series extended from 1976 to 2015, again, similar to Krista's, uh, which is basically when the advent of the coded wire tag program began. So the data that we're working with uh, differs from some similar analyses that have focused on Chinook maturation age. Uh, rather than looking at raw coded wire tag recoveries, um, we actually used outputs from the Chinook Technical, Technical Committee's exploitation rate analysis, um, which is basically a running reconstruction that allows them to estimate a couple different important demographic parameters, one of which being um, mean age of maturity. So I mentioned before that the goal of this analysis was to basically explore the relative support for evidence that specific ecological characteristics co-vary with patterns and demographic traits. And the approach that we took to address those hypotheses was competing a series of state-space models that basically group stocks by a suite of different attributes. Uh, these included life history strategy, so whether they were yearling or sub-yearling populations, run timing, uh, their ocean entry location, which we basically used as a proxy for early marine distribution, 
as well as adult marine distributions, which were inferred from uh, coded wire tags in fisheries. So this would range from offshore migrants to uh, local residents. Ultimately, what we found is that the best supported structure assigned trends based on juvenile life history strategy, as well as ocean entry location, which is somewhat counterintuitive. We really expected that adult marine distribution uh, based on CWT recoveries to, to drive these patterns, but it's not what we found. Ultimately, the, the top model structure identified four uh, distinct regional groupings. So we had our northern populations, predominantly yearling. Um, we had Strait of Georgia migrants, which are predominantly East Coast Vancouver Island or Fraser River stocks. We had Puget Sound subyearling and yearling populations. And then we had this hodgepodge mixture of subyearling stocks extending from the West Coast of Vancouver Island uh, through the Oregon uh, coast and including the Columbia River. So once we had these different um, ecological groupings, we next used a Bayesian dynamic factor analysis, which is just another flavor of state space model to um, address a couple more specific questions. First, what do the shared trends within a given group look like? Are they uh, relatively similar or different among these ecological groupings? Second, is there evidence of regime shifts in those, uh, in those trends consistent with a shift from older to younger age of maturity? And finally, we use that model to generate estimates of the change in mean age within a stock group relative to the time series average. And really that last component is because a lot of these state space models, uh, the outputs are, are interesting, but not necessarily immediately intuitive. Um, so you sort of have to do some some math to back calculate back to something that's actually in uh, um, a true maturation age. So I'll start with the, the coherent trends that we identified. Um, so this panel basically shows the five stock groups with enough uh, individual populations to uh, fit the model effectively. You can see yearlings in orange, sub yearlings in purple, uh, and our northern stocks on the left, southern stocks on the right. And right off the bat, you notice that there's not much of a pattern in the yearlings uh, coherent trend. It's fairly stationary, there's quite a bit of noise, but no real evidence of a strong decline. Conversely, when we look at the subyearling populations, we see that pretty dramatic downtick. But if you squint, you start to notice that the timing of that decline varies quite a bit between the Strait of Georgia, Puget, and Southern subyearlings, even though many of these populations have very similar um, marine distributions later in life. So this the top panels remain the same here. The bottom panel uh, reflects that second component I introduced. So basically, these are uh, um, hidden Markov models, which are used to test for evidence of a regime shift in those trends. And so when you see that flat line in the orange, that basically says that there's no strong evidence of a transition from an older to younger maturation age within this particular trend. However, when you look at the sub yearlings, again, we see a strong probability of a transition uh, from a high or an older maturation age to a younger maturation age with the timing of that transition varying quite a bit population group to population group. So you'll notice that for the Puget sub yearlings, it occurred in approximately the mid eighties, the Strait of Georgia sub yearlings, the early nineties, and then the Southern sub yearlings that occurred last in the late two thousands. So finally, we can use that overall model, which accounts for multiple trends, which weren't all shown here, as well as stock specific loadings on those trends to generate an estimate of how mean age of maturity has varied for each of these stock groups. So again, I'm showing the same population groups in the same order. They're no longer color coded by yearling versus sub yearling, but rather what an, whether a given year had evidence of being significantly below the time series average. And so what pops out is that the yearling population, uh, the Northern yearling stock group does show a modest decline in age of maturity, um, relatively less severe than the sub yearlings, which have declined by as much as six months, depending on the population group, whereas the Puget yearlings have been relatively stationary through time. Uh, some other interesting patterns is the non-linearities in these uh, relationships. So again, we see this relatively consistent spike around 2000 in maturation age before the decline proceeds for most of the stock groups. 
And ultimately, these declines in British Columbia, Washington, Oregon populations are quite a bit greater than previously considered. And we really think this is driven by the fact that we're using these CTC model outputs, which, as I mentioned before, account for things like variation in hatchery releases, sampling and harvest rates, um, which theoretically should give us a slightly more robust estimate of maturation age. So going back to my uh, little infographic driver slide, Again, we didn't test these hypotheses strictly quantitatively, but the trends that we observed are more or less consistent with a subset of uh, these different hypotheses. So like Krista, um, we don't think that declining harvest rates are playing a strong role in this, uh, in this area. For one, harvest is pretty variable up and down the coast, uh, but broadly speaking, it's declined for many of these stock groups, which is not consistent with sort of the rapid uh, reduction in uh, maturation age. Um, and we don't think hatchery release practices in this particular instance are driving a coastwide decline either. Although most of these populations are enhanced, uh, we did some preliminary analyses to sort of explore linkages with uh, mass at release and didn't detect any uh, strong patterns. Um, we found it particularly difficult to um, incorporate what we felt were relevant uh, proxies for density dependence and environmental effects just given the broad range of these populations, um, but we, we can't necessarily discount them. There's been a lot of evidence, some of which Chris have presented to suggest that basin scale uh, environmental conditions um, and increases in hatchery abundance uh, can have negative impacts on size and matur maturation age. Uh, the main point that I wanted to emphasize is that most of these populations have a relatively coastal uh, marine distribution based on the data at hand which really does minimize the extent to which they can interact with those hyperabundant stocks of pink sockeye and chum salmon, uh, which doesn't necessarily mean it doesn't happen, but I think we need to dig deeper to, to understand the mechanistic linkages there. Finally, uh, we would tend to put the weight of evidence with um, increasing natural mortality rates, most commonly attributed to marine mammals like resident killer whales. But again, I do wanna couch this observation in the, the fact that we we found some uh, interesting inconsistencies among those stock groups. So those Puget Sound subyearlings, uh, Southern subyearlings, Strait of Georgia subyearlings, they share a broad marine distribution. So it's not entirely clear why resident killer whale predation or some other predator would uh, sequentially drive uh, declines in maturity um, in each of those stock groups. So, now I really wanna shift gears pretty dramatically and pivot from Chinook salmon to sockeye salmon and from a whole bunch of populations to just one watershed. Uh, so this next component is really gonna focus on a recent paper that uh, we released that explored patterns in size and age for uh, Nass River sockeye salmon. And the unique attributes of this analysis are really driven by the data itself. Uh, it was a particularly long time series extending back to uh, 1914. And so the broad question we were interested in asking is, given this unique time set or data set, do we have an altered perception of what trends in size of age uh, might be driven by? So right off the bat, I want to extend a huge thanks to Skip McKinnell, um, who is a collaborator and co-author on this project and really uh, hit the ground running. Uh, he undertook a massive data mobilization effort, um, not only to digitize some of these historical uh, samples uh, and to, to ensure that they were saved for, for posterity's sake, but also to do the groundwork of reaching out and combining them with contemporary data sets collected by both DFO North Coast uh, Stock Assessment Staff um, and the Nishka Fish and Wildlife um, Agency. Um, the historical data are particularly interesting because, like I said, they were begun in 19, 1915 by Charles Gilbert, uh, who was a foundational ecologist um, at Stanford University. Among his many uh, exploits was the development of scale aging techniques, which uh, Krista introduced to you before. Um, and again, what I, what I want to highlight is the fact that the, the uniqueness of this analysis is really driven by the data set. It's an unusually long uh, spanning periods of extensive exploitation as well as environmental change. Um, and it's also focused on a watershed um, which has a unique amount of sockeye age diversity. So most British Columbia sockeye salmon populations have one or two ages, sometimes three, 
Uh, the NAS has six, four of which are abundant enough to make up a heavy proportion of the run in any given year, um, which allowed us to, to pursue some interesting analyses on age-specific trends in size at age. I'm not gonna get into the, the modeling meatiness, but basically we use specialized generalized additive models, which again, Krista introduced to you, uh, which helped to account for the Gabby time series, as well as changes in the timing and selectivity of sampling through uh, the course of the past century. So what did we observe? Um, these are basically model outputs that account as much as possible for those changes in sampling through time. Um, and they're broken down by sex, female and male, and orange and black, respectively, as well as the dominant age cohorts we considered. Um, and right off the bat, you see this general decline through time. And for context, it might be helpful just to highlight that uh, Krista's talk basically originated around, I think, 1975. So the front half of our time series is basically extending back from her previous analysis. So like her, we're seeing that rapid decline in recent years across all four age classes. And like her, we're seeing multiple standards of decline and increase. Um, one notable pattern is that the ocean age classes were originally divergent in trends. So the age twos on the left were sort of stable or declining right off the bat, whereas the um, ocean age threes actually increased for about 30 years before beginning to decline as well after which the, uh, the four age groups were relatively synchronous. Krista did a great job of introducing sort of the ecological linkage between body size and productivity. Um, we used a similar technique to basically estimate what the consequences of this sort of decline would be in terms of uh, productivity. In our case, we were looking at fecundity and we found that this was likely to result in a five to 20% decline in fecundity which has a really strong impact on productivity, especially when you consider that this is likely an underestimate given uh, well-established linkages between female size and not just fecundity, but also things like egg mass um, and um, maternal care in terms of guarding nests. So likely the, the total cumulative impacts on productivity are substantially larger. And so from a management perspective, this really suggests that escapement goals should be uh, more conservative than we would otherwise make them because effectively off the bat, you're gonna need 20% more spawners in some cases to get the same number of recruits that you were historically. So one component of this analysis that wasn't in the publication that I sort of undertook last minute after this talk was, was finalized um, was to incorporate some covariates in a way analogous to what, um, uh, what Krista presented. Unfortunately, the number of environmental covariates that extend, extend back to uh, the early 1900s is limited, um, but we were able to leverage uh, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation Time Series, as well as uh, the time series of total salmon abundance, well, pink chum sockeye salmon abundance that Jim Irvine uh, and uh, Gregor Gironi have curated. And as you can see here, we found pretty strong nonlinear effects that are, are consistent with what um, uh, has been documented in other systems. A positive PDO is associated with increased growth for uh, northern populations like these. Larger salmon abundances are associated with declines in size. However, like Krista, I think it's important to tell to emphasize what these models don't tell us as much as what they do. So these are residuals from the fitted models, again, similar to what Krista presented in her inset slide, which show this really dramatic decline um, over the course of the time series in body size. So basically between the beginning and the end, even after accounting for PDO and um, salmon abundance effects, you have about a 60 millimeter shift in body size. So while these uh, covariates are informative, they really aren't telling us much about the, the, the total picture. So unfortunately, um, this entire exercise seemed to raise more questions than it addressed. Uh, and I, I think it does a great job of emphasizing the holes in our understanding of sockeye salmon ecology in particular. Um, so we don't really think that selective harvest is driving declines recently. But historically, these stocks were hit with something like 80 to 90% exploitation rates in some years, um, and likely that lasted for decades uh, during the early part of the 1900s. So it's tough to, to say conclusively that that didn't have an impact, at least early on. 
resident killer whales don't appear to depredate sockeye salmon, but clearly something must, and we just don't know what it is. Uh, so it's difficult to uh, throw out predator effects either. Um, I think it's clear that there is the potential for density dependent impacts, but we also saw those large declines in body size well before hatchery uh, production really ramped up, which again suggests that uh, density dependence on its own is insufficient to explain these patterns. Uh, environmental conditions, as I said before, are particularly difficult to disentangle. Uh, we don't have a great idea of where uh, many stocks of sockeye salmon spend their marine lives. Uh, and NAS sockeye salmon are, are even more so than most. Um, so it, there's some evidence to suggest that environmental conditions are, are causing these synchronous declines. It's just not clear how that's actually being manifested. And finally, these populations uh, are not of hatchery origin, but there was a pretty dramatic management intervention to, to improve fish passage, which dramatically increased the capacity of certain freshwater systems in this watershed. Um, and it's unclear what impact that could have had. It occurred right about halfway through the time series, right when we saw that second precipitous decline in size of age. So again, it's something to consider. So I wanted to end by quickly um, providing some suggestions or thoughts on, on where we go from here. Uh, in recent years, there's been a really, really impressive contribution of um, well thought out and detailed an, uh, analyses to sort of document declines in age and body size, identify plausible drivers, and perhaps most importantly, highlight the management implications of these sorts of changes. However, there's still a big challenge in terms of weighting the relative importance of these different drivers, uh, which Chris introduced and I've sort of beaten, beaten around quite a bit as well. So in my opinion, we're now at a bit of a management crossroads. Uh, I think it's safe to say that we have enough information to describe broad qualitative patterns. Um, predation is likely to have negative impacts on age for Chinook. Competition in warming oceans likely aren't great for sockeye salmon, as well as many other stocks. Um, and in many cases, these directional estimates are, are adequate for management. They suggest that we should be precautionary moving forward, um, expect things to be less productive when they were in the past. However, if quantitative estimates are necessary to prioritize management actions or provide forecasts, I'm not really sure we have the necessary tools to provide reliable information just yet. Um, specifically, I think we need a much more integrated approach which allows us to account for the multiple interacting processes over the salmon life cycle. The fact that we have different drivers at play as well as uh, impacts on growth, maturation and survival, which all likely interact with one another uh, to influence abundance um, as well as trends in size. Uh, such models are inherently data hungry and they're gonna require a lot of effort to develop. However, we have new quantitative tools um, that make them much more feasible than we did in the past. And we have a, an entire cohort of really skilled quantitative ecologists that are, I think, ready to do this work. Um, additionally, a lot of the data necessary to fit these models is becoming more readily available. Uh, so this is just a screenshot from the Pacific Salmon Commission's biological data dashboard, uh, which Steve Latham introduced me to. And these sorts of long time series are exactly what we need to condition more comprehensive integrated life cycle models. Ultimately, if we decide to invest in this sort of approach, uh, I think it's important to, to make these things as flexible and versatile as possible. They need to account for key attributes of salmon dynamics, such as non-stationarity, uh, cyclical patterns in size at age, and heterogeneous spatial distributions. And I think they need to be explicitly designed uh, in a management context. Uh, they should be tuned to provide relevant information uh, about levers that we're actually able to pull. And, perhaps most importantly, allow for forward projections under various climate change, climate change and management scenarios, um, given the rapid pace at which um, population dynamics seem to be changing. Uh, getting that part of the equation right is critically important. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, a huge range of field technicians and biologists who collected these data over decades and even a century in some cases. Uh, my co-authors on these two papers uh, from both DFO as well as the University of Victoria, um, and a range of agency and non-agency staff who really made that um, uh, the different data sets available. Thanks.
Thank you, Cam, for a great talk. And again, um, so we're at 3.01 right now. So let's take a break of about five minutes. So we'll resume at 3.07 we'll now and um, give, give the audience ample opportunity to enter questions into the Q&A box so that we can uh, have some really productive discussion. So we will resume in five minutes. Well, welcome back. Oh, we've got Krista. So Lori, do you want to go ahead? Sure. Uh, this first question is for both of you from Tim Dalton. And he says, ask, have you compared trends in age at catch in the marine environment with age at return in freshwater? And if so, have you noticed any incongruities in that? I don't maybe mean, yes. I can jump in. Um, so we didn't like explicitly do that comparison. What we did do, um, and this is in the supplemental of the paper, I think, is we tried removing all of the commercial um, projects and only look at the escapement uh, projects. So that should only be size of the fish that have returned to freshwater. And we just wanted to make sure that we saw similar patterns um, when we removed those commercial um, projects from the data series. And we did see kind of overall pretty similar projects. So not explicitly, but tried to get at that. And we think there's pretty similar things going on. Yeah, I think I think Chris's better data is better suited to digging into that. Um, for the Chinook data that I or we analyzed, um, the models being driven by CWT recoveries in both fisheries as well as escapement grounds and hatchery brood take. So it's tough to sort of disentangle exactly what's going on there because of its model output. Um, and for the sockeye data set, uh, somewhat frustratingly, the decline is kind of confounded by different sampling periods. So historically, uh, all the scale data came from fisheries. In, in contemporary times, all the data comes from a, a fish wheel that the, the Nishka operate, or rather several fish wheels that the Nishka operate uh, within the Nass River main stem. Uh, and so we, we basically did some modeling to account for that as best as we could and sort of explore differences in selectivity between gill nets and, and fish wheels. Um, and it didn't seem to have a strong impact on the results, but uh, with those sorts of stark temporal differences, there's only so much you can do. Thanks, Cam. So we have a we have another question that can go to both of you from Katerina. So this is specifically for Chinook data. So for Chinook, there were some differences between maturity rates of hatchery and wild populations. So did you have a chance to look at the trends in maturation of wild populations and were those trends similar? I can maybe jump in again. Um, so for our data set, we weren't able to separate hatchery and wild fish. Um, we just didn't have kind of that individual level information. Um, it's likely that hatchery Chinook are probably making up a fairly small proportion of the hatcheries or the Chinook samples that we had. Um, so that might be more of a question for Cam. Um, but yeah, that wasn't really something we could look at. Yeah, I'm just trying to frantically pull up supplementary table that we had. Um, because it's been a while since I looked at the wild priest hatchery question. It's not actually in what I thought it was. If I remember correctly for, and Katarina, you probably know better than I do the, the details of a lot of those indicator stocks. But my impression is that there's very few wild indicators south of Southeast Alaska. So those Northern populations are predominantly wild or at least have a decent sampling of wild. Um, whereas further South, it's pretty much all hatchery releases. So on the one hand, um, the decline seemed to be weaker there. Um, but it's also confounded to some extent with yearling versus sub-yearling life histories, um, where we also found uh, weak evidence for a decline in that um, in those yearling Puget Sound populations. So I would tend towards saying that at least with that data set, there's not a striking difference between wild and hatchery. Um, but I don't have the answer at my fingertips. 
we don't have any other questions at the moment, so put them in there. I guess we do have one for you, Krista, from uh, Laura Erickson. She says, were you talking about the decline of size at age? Just wanted a clarity on that. So most of our analyses, we're looking at population mean size. So those changes in size that we're looking at are going to be composed of both changing age and size at age. I guess I had a question for both of you. I My understanding is that different fishery types, like whether you're trolling or using something like a pursane, the size selectivity is very different. Did you, since you're both using multiple species, did you try and look at that and did it seem like it made sense or just wondering if you could speak to that a little bit? So that was something we were really interested in looking at and tried to look at and kind of ran into some issues with how consistently we kind of had records of what gear type um, was used. But for that kind of sub-analysis that I was talking about with harvest rate, um, we were pretty limited in the number of populations we could reliably get harvest rate. And I think a lot of them are using pretty similar gear types. So I think that's something that we would have loved to look at that we weren't really able to. Yeah. So I kind of, I don't have a lot to add to the sockeye side of the story beyond saying that we, we didn't find strong evidence of the, uh, of selectivity in the historical data, even though they were using gill nets, basically the, uh, they had such a wide range of mesh sizes that the only things they weren't ca catching were like tiny, tiny sockeye, uh, which we kind of excluded from the analysis based on those uh, age classes not being well represented. On the Chinook side of the story, I think it's an interesting question. I'm not sure if I'd have to talk to Chuck and some of the others who are more familiar with the guts of the, the CTC run reconstruction model, because every time I look at it, I, it takes me a couple of days to stop being confused. But you raise a good point, at least in BC, I'm just trying to think intuitively if this makes sense. So there's sort of been competing directional pressures on Chinook fisheries in Southern BC. Or it seems as though on the one hand, certain areas have had uh, reductions in minimum size limits. So in the nineties, it went down from 67 to 55 centimeters for the West Coast troll fleet which would tend to push it the opposite way because all of a sudden you'd be fishing a lot more of your younger age classes. On the other hand, it seems as though there's been a general switch towards um, terminal fisheries, which are predominantly uh, gill nets and, and to a lesser extent sane, or at least the ones I'm familiar with. And depend, I don't know enough about how those are managed to know how selective or size selective they are, uh, but you could imagine those being really uh, adept at removing the largest members of a population. But the likelihood of that occurring coast-wide, I think is, I'd assume it's not likely, but it's tough to tough to run down all that information for coast-wide analysis, as, as Krista pointed out. For a type of data that seems very straightforward, you know, it's, it's actually amazingly complicated. Sure. So then the next question I have is from Urs, and it's, uh, I guess it's for you, more for you, Cam. Uh, but it seems like you amassed that pretty incredible data set with the help of Skip McKinnell. And so I was just wondering if there's a separate study or paper available on the NAS sockeye um, data set. Um, it looks like Kim Bartlett wants to answer this question, but I'm not sure if that's just how the Q&A works. Uh, but I'll, I'll talk and then Kim can jump in after. Um, there's not a separate study or paper available, but part of our goal with that publication. It was kind of off the side of my desk and Skip's mostly retired and Francis has a bunch of other stuff on his plate was just to make it accessible. Um, so it was published along with the paper. So if folks want to pick it up and run with it, um, we encourage them to do so. Um, and, and definitely feel free to reach out to me or perhaps more likely Skip if you have any questions. I do. I was actually just emailed by someone in uh, John Reynolds' lab at SFU. I don't remember her name, uh, but she's undertaking a similar analysis looking at scale growth with archive samples from the Skeena 
So a river slightly further south, that's also a major, or historically is a major sockeye production system. Um, so yeah, there, there's other work leveraging these long time series, but we don't have any specific publications associated with the, the NAS data set or ongoing work. So I have another question for the both of you. Um, so one of the trends that you both evaluated was the mean fork length, like using um, uh, the GAM analysis. And what was really striking was that there appeared to be sort of this synchronous two periods in the time series where, where there was a rebound in size. So one in sort of like the mid 80s and another in the mid 2000s. So um, given that you didn't see the, you know, really strong relationships with environmental or competition factors, like you want to speculate on why, why size may have rebounded during those periods? Sure. That's a hard one. So yeah, I would say we did see some strong associations with certain covariates, but um, not, it's hard to kind of pick a specific time point and pull out what was going on there, especially kind of um, at the scale of the analyses that we're doing. Um, but I think also some of those and recoveries also kind of show up in those residual trends that we included. So we thought a lot about that. We also were wondering what could be going on. And I think right now I don't really have a good answer for you on what exactly was going on for like specific time periods. Uh, wish I could <laughs> say more. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that's the the million dollar question, I guess. Um, I'd be interested in looking at, well, sitting down with some physical and biological oceanographers to give it a handle. Like I'm familiar with the traditional regime shifts. Um, these don't seem to line up perfectly with them, um, but just to get a handle on whether they saw similar anomalies in any of the, the sort of zooplankton indices that they typically gather. Something else that I was sort of curious about, I don't know enough about Alaskan marine distributions, but we did see the spike or the small spike in size at maturity in the early 2000s did coincide with what anecdotally seemed to be like a particularly brutal time to be a Chinook salmon in the Salish Sea. Um, it's when marine survival is particularly low and uh, fisheries were particularly awful. Um, so maybe there's some localized density dependent effects with those stocks that that spent a lot of time sort of in coastal Washington and, and coastal southern British Columbia for their marine life history. But that's a just a total hypothesis, like off the cuff hypothesis. It's also interesting that most Chinook that are caught in Alaskan waters don't originate from Alaskan waters. I mean, they're BC, other areas, coastal Washington, Columbia River. So kind of trying to sort that out would be a little bit tricky. Uh, we have a comment right from Steve yeah. Latham. Uh, he said it's a great talks for Fraser sockeye. We've compiled data comparing ages on spawning grounds to ages by fisheries, by stock, and found ages uh, agree, which is not yet a formal analysis. Comparing lengths between the two data sources is more complicated. Marine purse and an in-river variable mesh gill nets also seem to be very similar in both age and length of age. So there's a case where two very different gear types with presumably very different selectivity um, are showing similar results. So it's kind of interesting. Uh, and then Dan Auerbach has a question that he said, this may be basic salmon biology, but I don't, uh, whoa, uh, what degree do we think size at age is genotypically controlled versus phenotypically plastic. Where is a geneticist when you need them? <laughs> any any comments on that from either of you? Well, Krista came from the Hendry lab. I feel like <laughs> I can take a stab at it since she's had to go first every other time. But um, I would say it's not, it's it's not a bit it is a basic salmon biology question but i don't think there's a concrete answer uh it seems as though both are at play my impression is that age at maturity 
is more heritable than size at age, but that both are plastic um, and not just plastic from during like the, the last portion when they're making their like spawning decision, but also plastic based on freshwater residents, which is why those hatchery rearing practices can have such a big impact on not so much size at age, but definitely uh, maturation age. Uh, but maybe I'm off base there, Krista. No, I I would agree. Um, yeah, I think there's been more work looking at like the genetic basis of age at maturity for a salmon, but size at age, I mean, yeah, it has to, to some extent, be plastic. And that's why we see these impacts of like temperature on growth. Um, so I think both may be a little more plastic than age, but I think that, you know, also a really great question that we probably don't have as good a handle on yet as we might like to. All right, so the next question is, you know, instead of a comment from Steve Latham, it's a, it's a question. So uh, at one point, Greg Rizroni uh, published a paper that looked at the impact of pink salmon in the North Pacific, inferred from odd year and even year effects on growth of Chinook and sockeye salmon. So um, I think he, he thinks it was looking at scale growth, I believe it was. So um, did either of you detect these odd, even um, observed or observable uh, difference in in size or uh, size of maturity, uh, size of age. I know we've seen that in chum salmon in in Washington, so sort of interannual variation in size at age or age at maturity. I was trying to find it, I, but I couldn't find the figure. We did look at um for the sockeye data set anyways uh not just total abundance but also we split the residuals into odd even years and so basically what you would expect if there was a strong effect there independent of pink salmon abundance or driven by pink abundance that wasn't included in the model would be that you're you'd have a strong positive negative residual split between the odd even years um, I can never remember off the cuff, which is the abundant one. So I won't wait into that, but we didn't see it. Basically the both residuals, regardless of year were, were centered on zero, which is kind of consistent with that, um, modest effect size that we identified. I'm also trying to remember exactly how we handled the even odd effects. It's been a little while since we kind of ran these analyses, but I would hope that, you know, because we did include both abundance of Alaska pink and North Pacific wide pink, that like that even odd difference is kind of built into including both of those abundances. And so I think, especially where we see like these strong negative associations between sockeye size and pink abundances, I think that's kind of a similar signal to what Greg has shown in the past. Well, it doesn't look like we have any other questions and we're quickly running out of time so i'd like to thank you both for a really fascinating seminar that was really great and obviously uh generated a lot of interesting discussion and thoughts and something that seems really simple <laughs> really isn't uh is really fascinating and, and that changing size is like cam pointed out can be really means a lot of different things uh, so thank you both for that those that, that was really wonderful our next seminar is July 26th, and this we won't have a seminar in August, but we will resume in September. So please stay tuned and come back and uh, watch the seminar on July 26th on large scale habitat restoration projects. And then also this recording will be available in a few days on the PSC's YouTube website. So for if you missed it or want to share it with others, it will be available there. So with that, I want to thank you again to our speakers and thanks to everybody who watched it. Thanks. Yeah, thanks so much for the invitation. Take care, everyone.